All right, hello and welcome to today's webinar, Technical Documentation Essentials, sponsored by Oregon State's Professional and Continuing Ed Unit. I am Melanie Mitchell, the Director of Professional and Continuing Ed. Uh, Oregon State PACE, we call ourselves, we like to engage with the community through higher education opportunities for both personal enrichment and also professional development. Here at PACE, we offer hundreds of courses, certificate programs that are open to the public, and we see value through these quality programs that offer address educational, professional, and economic development goals for you and your organization. All of our courses and programs can be brought in company to a groups of employees and customized in that same nature. Partnerships provide amazing opportunities for professional and continuing education that advance careers, foster per professional development, and benefit communities of all shapes and sizes across Oregon. So here at PACE, we're com uh, committed to bringing the best of Oregon State University to all people and industries um, across Oregon. And we are proud to partner with the College of Liberal Arts School of Writing, Literature, and Film to do just that. So here today with me, I have three panelists. Uh, we're going to learn from Rich Collins, who is the instructor for technical writing um, here offered through PACE in partnership with the college. Uh, Rich holds a master's in English literature from Oregon State University and a BA in English and minors in um, German creative writing and film studies from West Georgia University. Uh, Rich has worked in a variety of areas, professional careers, starting from retail to nonprofit sector, also with AmeriCorps, healthcare, and most recently, the college administration doing marketing and recruitment. He currently serves as an instructor with the college, the School of uh, Writing, Literature, and Film, um, and focuses his classroom experiences, his, his real life experiences into the classroom. Uh, his own research interest centers on 20th century American literature, and he's committed to assisting and developing writers in the classroom. Thanks, Rich, for being here. Yeah, glad to be here. Uh, also, across the table here for a great discussion, we have instructor from, uh, it's also the School of Writing, Literature, and Film, Claire Braun. And also Erin Flutwalter, which is faculty from the College of Writing, Literature, and Film. So thank you both for being here. Glad to be here. Yeah, happy to be here. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. I want to tell a little bit about today's um, presentation. We are going to be recording the session. Reminder for everybody to chat early and chat often to the questions. Um, get, get your questions in the, the chat box. Emily Henry is on the line to help facilitate. Uh, facilitate your questions about the webinar. We want to make sure there's a nice engagement between the panelists today. Our recording will be sent to you within the next 24 hours, also with these slides for download. Thanks so much. I just told you a little bit about PACE um, and our courses that we offer. Today's agenda, we're going to go over um, the do's and don'ts of technical writing, uh, this course that's up and coming this spring, the benefits of the course, we're going to have a nice question and answer part of the presentation conversation throughout. And we want to give you our contact information in case your questions, you have questions tomorrow and you want to get, get in touch with us. We want to make sure we're available to leave no question unturned. There is Rich Collins, our um, panelist today. And then we're going to get right into his presentation about the do's and don'ts of technical writing. So thanks, Rich. Um. Great. So yeah, we'll start off. Uh, we're going to kind of go through five do's and don'ts of technical writing. So we'll start off here with the five don'ts. So the first don't is don't use terms that your reader doesn't know. I have a few examples here such as capacity building, synergy, ideation, GUI or GUI, um, rhizomatic infrastructure, and K2 TOG, which was a new one for me. Um, but all of these are terms that can be used in a lot of different ways and could probably use some explanation when you're using them in certain documentation. Um, I know capacity building, for example, whenever I was working in the nonprofit industry, it was used a ton. And it took me a couple of months to figure out exactly what it meant because it was kind of thrown around as a buzzword. And basically it means building infrastructure for organizations, so making things more sustainable, um, so that it's um, going to be able to kind of live on after you're gone. But it kind of took me a long time to grapple with that term and everyone was using it and I found it really confusing whenever I started working in the nonprofit sector. Um, and it, another one I'm going to jump down, the rhizomatic infrastructure is one that I'm personally interested in just because it's used in a few different contexts. Uh, rhizomes are 
used in science communication a lot of times. It's uh, what we refer to as like, if you were thinking of a mushroom, for example, if you look at a field of mushrooms, they might actually be one living organism because they're all connected underground. But then it's also used in academic writing because Felix um, Guattari and Gilles Deleuze use some of their philosophy, and so it's used in a much different way. And so we want to be sure that in technical writing, whenever we're using any kind of term, that we're kind of defining it and making sure that our reader knows what we're talking about. Yeah, I would, I would, I would even add to that, too. That, um, it's really hard to know what terms your audience knows, especially if you're brand new to a field. So we tend to call this, you know, what's your discourse community? And there's all kinds of discourse communities that we're involved in. When you start a new job or when you start working in a particular industry, it takes a while before you have to know what your discourse community knows. And a lot of that just is you have to read a lot of things and you have to talk to a lot of people. And when in doubt, like Rich said, define it. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things you don't want your, your audience to go like, what is that? And this person is not helping me. If you have, they have that question, they should always get that answer right away. Yeah, the K2 TOG one is one that I encounter in knitting patterns a lot. And it's like I'm really familiar with it, so when I, I, I see it, I, my brain translates it automatically to knit two together. Um, but if you were new, a new knitter, you would not know what that meant unless um, the writer of a, a pattern defines that for you at the beginning. Right. Yeah, that's actually one that comes up. Um, I'm teaching technical writing on campus right now, and I have a few students who are doing knitting projects and things like that. So it actually does come up quite a bit in some kinds of technical communication. So our number four, don't forget to be consistent with the terms. So you want to define your terms early if necessary. You want to use those specific terms often and in context, and you want to double check for words that you haven't defined or explained. And I think this goes back to what Aaron was talking about. Whenever we're inside of these discourse communities, it can be difficult to remember what terms people outside of that community might not be familiar with. So you want to be sure that you're defining those and you're using them consistently throughout. Um, one of the examples I've been looking at recently is a how to build a fly rod manual, which it's written by fly fishermen for fly fishermen. So it isn't exactly accessible to a lot of people who might be outside of that community, but it'll use specific terms without really defining them, like blank and guide feet and ferrules. And then it uses spine or spline um, interchangeably, and then belly, which is like the under, underside of the spine. And it uses all of these terms without defining them, um, and it can be really confusing for people who aren't familiar with that. So, that, so we want to make sure in our technical writing that we're defining those terms and then using them consistently and explaining why we're using them um, throughout our, our technical communication. I'd even add that uh, one of the things that people usually ask when they're learning about how to write technical manuals is, is it okay if I repeat myself? Absolutely, you repeat yourself. In fact, it's only a good thing that rep for repetition in a technical manual because it's, if you're learning something new, the third time you see that word and it gets defined again for that third time, you'll get that point, right? And what you're we're trying to do in a technical manual is make sure people walk away from it being able to do something, I also have been pretty confident that whole way through. And if you just repeat yourself, that was, you know, to some extent, um, you know, you'll, 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 you'll instill that confidence in people. So our number three is don't write long, complicated sentences. So I have a long, complicated sentence here. Uh, in order to build a computer, you should go out and buy all of the necessary components, such as processor, motherboard, RAM, etc. Find a space, find a safe, static-free workplace where you can assemble all of the pieces, making sure you won't be disturbed for a couple of hours, and assemble all of your tools. A list of which is detailed on the following page. Um, and so I think that this does happen a lot in you know really complicated manuals where you have these big blocks of text. And that can make it difficult for the reader whenever they're trying to go back and find the exact piece that they're looking for. They have to wade through all of this information in order to get to the necessary um, components or the necessary task that they're trying to do. And so we try to break up these long, complicated sentences into multiple sentences. Sometimes we use bullet points to make things a little bit simpler. Um, and just trying to you know, keep that user in mind and make sure that they can find the information that they need. Yeah, and I also had a lot of people ask, like, how long should a sentence be? And there's no perfect answer for that kind of thing. I always say an instruction <coughs> manual should be as long as an action, which is a weird thing to say, but is if you can read a sentence and then do something, great. 
If you have to read a sentence and then try to do four things, you're in trouble because you got to read that sentence again at least once or twice more to remember all the stuff you're supposed to do. Right. So it's sort of as long as that action should, you know, read a sentence, do something, read a sentence, do something. That's often how it goes. Yeah. So our second don't is don't forget to warn your users of dangers. So a couple examples here. Remember to unplug the toaster oven before you begin cleaning. Caution, this next step requires working with electricity. Please consult Appendix B for more information on the model available in your country. Um, so these warnings, they can be really useful in instruction manuals and descriptions, especially when you're working with electronics, for example, anything involving electricity. Um, I was actually watching a video recently and the person was talking about capacitors and how they will hold a charge. And so whenever you're disassembling certain pieces of electronics, um, you can get a shock even if it's unplugged. So if you were writing an instruction manual about that, you would probably want to warn the user of that possibility and make sure that you're keeping them safe. Um, same thing with any kind of kitchen appliances where you're dealing with heat or sharp edges. Um, all of those kinds of elements will need to be detailed so that you're warning the user and making sure that they stay safe. Um, for companies, this can be a liability issue, but even for pers even whenever you're writing things that might not be under a, a huge corporation, it's important that you're keeping that in mind. This kind of goes back to your previous point about long, complicated sentences. You don't want the warning to be embedded in the middle of like a really long sentence where it might not stand out. Having things like the capital letters and exclamation points and other formatting type issues to make those warnings stand out. Uh, make the warning actually usable and yep. helpful. <laughs> and, and you know, your your ultimate goal is to make your users, you know, they should be safe and happy when when going through your instructions. And that's part of taking care of your user, which we'll talk about in some other steps. But um, yeah, if they're safe and happy and they're getting the process done, that's super. Yeah, definitely. So our last don't here is don't assume too much of your audience's knowledge. Uh, there are a couple of examples here. So put the wheels on the bike after you get the tires on. Um, that's assuming a lot of your audience's knowledge. I can tell you personally, putting tires on a bicycle rim is a very complicated process. So you probably want to explain that. Uh, insert the ram stick into the proper dim slot. Cast on 100 stitches. This is another knitting example of explaining what casting on is. Um, I find that a lot of times, I'll run into these problems with how-to guides that are online. Um, whenever I'm searching, trying to figure out a process, I end up finding a how-to guide, and then I end up researching a lot of terms and researching the product, and I end up spending half of the time figuring out what it's trying to tell me um, just so that I can get the, the task completed. And so, you know, good technical writing will walk the user through that whole process. Once again, keeping them in mind um, and trying to make sure that they have all of the information that they need to complete the task. Yeah, that's the situation I always think of is, um, so I, I don't know how many people went home for the holidays and then had to do tech support for various family members on different products. <laughs> uh, but I got to do that a lot. And um, often I have to do it over the phone. And the tricky thing about that is, is I'm not 100% sure what my other family members know about the context. So you know, trying to explain certain things, and I'll often say, like, oh, you know, like you said, like, go get the RAM stick and, and sort of and put it in the back closet of the, the computer, make sure you have it the right way up. And they're like, I'm not sure what you mean by the first part of that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to kind of walk it back, and then, which is exactly like, like your earlier point, too, being as specific as you can with terms and trying not to assume too much knowledge because you often don't have a lot of knowledge about the context in which your users are working with them. Right. So we're going to move here now to our five do's of technical writing, things we do want to make sure we're doing in all of our technical communication documents. So do tell your audience exactly what they need. Um, so in recipes, they can be kind of give and take on this, but um, here would be an example. You need the following ingredients to make peanut butter cookies, peanut butter, eggs, and white sugar. Um, I find that recipes often do get this right, but they often get it wrong as well. There's been a number of times I'll get to the end of a recipe and it'll tell you to add something that it didn't list in the ingredients. Most of the time, this is salt or pepper or oil or butter or something like that, but probably important to include that at the beginning. Um, this is actually something I've noticed, and to go back to my example of the bike maintenance, um, I've been looking through a, a book recently that does this pretty well. It has all of the tools that you need at the beginning, 
listed exactly what they are, what purposes they serve, has a picture of all of the tools. Um, and so I think that that's the kind of thing we're really aiming for in technical communication, or in technical writing, is making sure that you detail all of those items at the beginning so that your audience has all of the tools um, that they will need going into the process. And I think it can be helpful to, to make sure that you're, I mean, it depends on what technical uh, process you're talking about, but like with a recipe, you need ingredients and tools. And it can be helpful to, to list both of those, maybe even separately, so that um, somebody knows not only what like raw products they need to go into their final product, but also what tools they need in order to, to mix those things appropriately. And the same thing can happen with, with a bike, for example. Like you need all of your parts, but you also need the tools to put it together, and those aren't necessarily the same list. And it's really frustrating if you get halfway through assembling all of your parts, because you have all your parts, but you don't have the right tool to, right. to put yeah. something on at the end. Sort of judge that by how often are you unpleasantly surprised when performing an instruction task? And yep. if you find yourself unpleasantly surprised, something has gone wrong with that instruction. Right. Pleasant surprises could be great. Like, oh, I didn't realize that fit together so well. But um, the unpleasant surprise is super. You yep. tell me I need that ingredient now. I've got to go to the grocery store. Right. And things are on the oven. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. That's an unpleasant surprise. Yeah. And I think that this is something that happens when, once again when you're kind of used to working within that field and you're not thinking about people outside of that field. If you're used to cooking a lot, then of course you know that you need to have olive oil and salt and pepper. But you know, whenever I was 18 and learning how to cook, I didn't know that I needed those things necessarily. So it can be useful to try and keep all of those users in mind so that you're communicating and, and making sure everyone has the information they need. Another do. Do make sure to use diagrams that show movement. These are really helpful. So a couple of examples here. We have a toothbrush head that is rotating, um, and we have a piece that's on a big piece of commercial kitchen equipment and showing the, the pulling out um, of this particular part. These can be really useful, um, and they can be more efficient in trying to explain in words um, what this motion looks like and what these movements look like. Uh, I think a really big example of these this kind of communication would be IKEA manuals, which use a surprisingly small amount of language um, in the manuals, but do a lot of uh, using the arrows to show different movement and how things move together. Um, and this is something that you have to think really carefully about. Um, I've certainly built a dresser drawer inside out or something <laughs> like that, so um, it can kind of break down. But it, it's something to, to think really carefully about and make sure that you're using well in your technical writing documents. Yeah, I was uh, setting up a microphone and speaker system uh, last week for for an event, and I had never dealt with this particular equipment before. But luckily, the instructions that I was left with included not only verbal instructions, like a list of like ten steps, but it also included images. Which, without those images, I would not have been able to figure out what uh, each piece was and how they were supposed to fit together. I love that one of the two diagrams on this page not only shows directions for arrows and force and movement, it also shows someone's hand. Yeah. Which is one of those tricky things. You're like, you see someone's hand and an image of what you're supposed to do, talking to scientists will have all kinds of explanations about why we'll make associations that are really positive for that. Mm -hmm. But we'll just look at it and see and like, uh, that could be my hand. Right. And you, <laughs> see, you see yourself in this situation doing the exact same thing safely and appropriately, and that's actually a really effective technique. Yeah, and also um, another thing that's useful about showing a hand or, or something we're familiar with is that it gives you a sense of scale, um, yeah. and so you kind of know basically what you're dealing with a big piece of equipment there, um, because you can kind of, we all know the basic size of the hand. So that yeah, if you hadn't seen a toothbrush, you might be confused. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Enormous toothbrush. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's true. So our number three, whenever you're using images, do make sure that you label and name your steps and caption your images. So we have an example here from a manual on how to make butter. So fill the jar halfway with cream, and then we have the caption there in the image filling the jar with cream, and then a caution. The cream needs at least half of the jar to move through. Do not overfill, because you need to shake it in order to make the butter. Um, and so you want to make sure in your technical communication documents that you are putting in all of these different components that you're putting on the, you're captioning your images, you're clearly labeling your steps. Um, so if we're thinking of captions, you know, textbooks, encyclopedias usually do this pretty well. Um, 
labeling your steps. I actually find that a lot of how-to guides that are online do this pretty well, where they'll have like the one, two, three as they're walking you through the different steps and kind of keeping everything clear. And so that's the kind of communication that we want to be doing as well in, in technical writing. Yeah, it's all about repetition and specificity. I mean, it doesn't sound exciting, but what's cool about it is that when you're doing a process, you really appreciate when somebody has taken the time to be repetitive when necessary and specific so that you don't get lost. Yeah. Nobody likes to get lost. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We actually have a question that might fit well here as well. It kind of relates back to your warning slide, but also the caution here. Um, so our question is, do you find negatives work better under warnings? For example, do not store rather than please store. I think it probably depends upon the nature of the warning. So if it's something that's you know really severe, if you're dealing with electricity, for example, then do not plug this in while you're working on it is probably going to be pretty effective because it's kind of warning against that. But if it's more of a suggestion like you should really do this, then um, I think that the positive can be effective. But I think the, the negative probably carries a stronger connotation. It seems more of a, more like a command to me. Yeah, it, 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 a lot of that's with context. But sometimes the, the to do's can be not necessarily warnings or cautions or mm -hmm. hazards, but they can be notes. So things that may not be 100% something you better not do, otherwise you'll electrocute yourself, which is definitely for a warning or a caution. But something that could be helpful, but not 100% important to do for the task at hand, we usually sort of, we can find another category. You can say like, well, this is a note, and this is a helpful sort of sidebar tip. Right. Tips and tricks, we'll sort of label them as too. Yeah. Where it's, um, you know, um, it, it, when I make, going back to recipe making, when you make dough, sometimes what, you put it in the, the, the refrigerator the mm -hmm. night before, right, because it's easier in the butter and it doesn't melt in certain ways. Right. Um, you know, that may be a tip or a trick, or depending on how important you judge it to be, it could be a caution. You know, yeah. so a lot of it's contextual, but sometimes we separate those out. Yeah. Yeah, I think that for the, for the more severe outcomes, you want to use usually the negative construction um, to emphasize how much you really shouldn't do that. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's true. I think that leads us well into our next point, actually, which is do use imperative mood writing throughout. Um, so you will, imperative mood writing is issuing commands or requests. We have a few examples here. So please be careful when assembling. Do not inhale fumes. That's probably pretty important. <laughs> <laughs> um, test before using. Please use only with our brand products, which is, you know, probably less important. Um, and so you can kind of see that playing out there. Uh, one of the things that's important to note here about using this kind of language is that in technical writing, the reader is coming to you for information. So if we think about a lot of other forms of writing, like uh, academic writing or creative writing, um, a lot of times you're having to do a lot of work to kind of hook the reader and bring them in. And um, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different priorities that are going on. Um, and we do want to keep the user at the center in technical communication and in technical writing, but um, they're coming to you for information. You can kind of cut through a lot of those other elements and just get to the commands, just get to exactly what they need to know to complete the task that they're working on. Yeah, it's interesting. The imperative mood might seem uh, rude in other contexts, like mm -hmm. if you're writing an email to somebody, for example, um, and they're giving you all these kinds of commands that might seem kind of overbearing or rude, but it's different in an instruction manual because people are coming to you for information and they want to be told what to do. Right. Um, so doing using the imperative mood is kind of the simplest, most straightforward way uh, to get that across. Yeah. I always think of it as that there's that always that scene in the bad 1980s action movie where someone is on the phone and they're trying to cut the right wires to disarm the bomb. Mm -hmm. That's imperative mood at its best. The instructions <laughs> that are going through is always explicitly just cut the red wire. Yeah. That's, you, somebody really needs information and you're there to tell them what to do. Yep. And that's often, usually with less intensity, but that's yep. the same situation <laughs> for an instruction manual. Someone needs something and you're there to help them through that. Right. Definitely. And so our last do here, which I think ties up a lot of what we've been talking about, is do use a user-centered approach in writing. And so in all of the technical writing, you want to keep the end user's needs in mind. And the end user is what we refer to whenever we're thinking about the person who is using a piece of technical writing, who's undergoing the process, who's using an instruction manual, um, all of those different such situations. And you want to make sure that you're keeping them safe whenever they're um, dealing with pieces, you know, 
dealing with any situation that might be unsafe that could cause them some harm, but also just keeping them comfortable. Um, you know, if you're building a bookshelf or if you're trying to get your printer installed on a new computer, then it might not be an incredibly dangerous situation, but you want to try and keep the end user as comfortable as possible, make sure they have all of the tools that they need without anything extra, um, and just really communicating the information that they need to do the job. I always like to sort of say like you're happy, healthy, and confident. Yeah. When you're going through, <laughs> it's, yeah, it sounds silly to say that for building a bookshelf, but confidence is a surprisingly mm -hmm. important thing for an instruction manual because yeah. if somebody does a task, if they do step one, let's say, and then they do it well, and then they they feel like, oh, this instruction manual is leading me on a pretty good pace. By the time they get to step eight and everything's going smoothly, they're incredibly confident. They know they can, they know how to read the instruction manual, they know how to do the task, and they leave the situation of whatever they had to do feeling pretty proud of themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, for all the times when you've been upset with the instruction manual, nine times out of ten, I bet it's because you haven't had confidence in the manual in some way. Right. That's a sneakily important thing. Yeah, and it can be like a, a time and therefore money saving issue, you know, when, um, when you're, like, if, when I was setting up that sound system last week, if I had felt less confident, I would have had to reread the instructions probably I don't know, three times for each step because I wasn't really confident in what I was doing, but because the instructions weren't um, unclear and they were put together well, I had confidence that I could just kind of easily move from one step to another and I didn't have to reread to make sure that I was understanding it properly. And I mean, any time a process ends up taking longer, then sort of time is money. Right. Yeah, I find not to keep using the same examples, but I find that a lot in recipes as well, where I end up reading the same step ten times because there will be actually ten different steps in there. And um, Suddenly a 30-minute meal is an hour. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, because I'm spending half of the time yeah. reading what I'm supposed yeah. to be doing. And so um, you want to make sure that you're, you're tailoring that information um, in a certain way. I was also thinking about one of the examples that's come up in my technical writing classes is Lego manuals, which also don't use language but are incredibly effective, and it's because they're tailored for kids. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, whenever, you know, even as an adult, I like to build Legos every now and then. Um, <laughs> and so it's it's not usually not that confusing. You can usually figure it out really easily, even though there's no language in there. Um, and I think that that's probably because they're keeping that user, that end user in mind, who most of the time is going to be a child. This is exciting. Thank you so much. This concludes our kind of presentation part. We want to take in questions. We want to um, hear from you about the presentation, any questions you had about any of the do's or the don'ts, um, how you see applying these do's and don'ts in your, uh, in your work. Um, so please chat in your questions. I am going to um, just tell you a little bit about our upcoming technical writing course as we're waiting for your questions to arise. Um, we have we actually two have opportunities. One Oh, good. Thanks, thanks yeah. Emily. Yep. Yeah, so, um, well, more of a statement, but I think it would be a good discussion point. Um, so, makes me think that adding a time requirement could be a good idea, like adding 30 minutes to a section so the reader knows how long it should take. Is that something that you all would agree with? Definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that example just came up of uh, when you're going through a recipe. Mm -hmm. Now, my, my, my wife is an amazing cook. When it says 35 minutes for a recipe, it will take her 30 minutes. When it says 35 minutes for me, I know to sort of translate that into my language. It's going to be about an hour. Right. That. But what, that's one of the great things in terms of, I think, um, Rich mentioned earlier about you, you should let your audience know what they're in for before the manual, like as the manual just starts. And that first page has all the tools you're going to need, all the ingredients you're going to need, um, the sort of situation if you need a big flat surface. And it often includes a reference to time, too. Yeah. Absolutely. And you can include two references to time, even you know, somebody who's an expert, this should take you about 20 minutes. If sure. this is your first time, then right. plan for a little longer. Yeah. Uh, but that's a, it's a helpful thing for somebody setting out to, to embark on a process to know sort of what to expect yeah. time-wise. Definitely. And I think it can be difficult. Um, because if you're someone who's used to doing these tasks, then it does come really quickly. Um, so if you've changed hundreds of bicycle tires, then you can probably do it in 
15 minutes. But if I'm doing it, I'm going to be you know, fighting with it a little bit. It's going to take me a little bit longer. Um, and so keeping the skill set in mind and, and keeping the end user in mind in a way um, and realizing that they may not have the experience and knowledge that you have. And sometimes you know in a given writing situation that your audience is going to be fairly homogenous in their skill level. Um, so if you're writing a manual for, like to go off of the, the bike maintenance example, if you're writing a manual for people in their sort of everyday homes, then you know that like they might not have that kind of experience and you can write it accordingly and your time estimates can be given accordingly. But if you are writing that manual for uh, people who are working in a bike shop, you can rely on them having a bit more experience and, right. and you can tailor the instructions accordingly. Yeah. You can certainly add not just time, you can add all kinds of other things. I saw a great one recently, which was the question and then the answer for it in the beginning of an instruction manual. How dirty will I get? In this <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then sort of like, well, you're going to get grease in your hands, mm -hmm. you're going to wear some old clothes. And I was like, that's never that's helped really me. helpful. Because now I know that I just need to go and I'll do this at a different time, right? Yep. I'm not going to do it 10 minutes before I'm meeting where I have to wear a nice shirt. Yep. yep. Yeah. <laughs> things like that. Anything that sort of helps your audience with context about. What am I going to, it's that unpleasant surprise again. Right. You're gonna, they're going to be unpleasantly surprised. They're going to be upset with your manual. Yeah. And one thing, uh, a little bit of a tangent, but I meant to mention it during the last slide, is that we're really going to go into more detail on all of these points in the, the PACE workshop. So we'll be working on a couple of different um, technical writing documents and really putting these, these especially this user-centered writing um, into practice and all of those and thinking about all the different ways that that might manifest itself in different forms. Right. Emily, great. is there we any other questions? questions? That yeah, we oh, do great. have a couple more that have been. So the first one is, what are the rules concerning the use of you or your? That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of, not to jump in, but you know, a lot of uh, companies have specific rules for different kinds of manuals regarding you and your. Um, on the whole, though, you're, you're encouraged to use them in an instruction manual because um, it's only because you're directly talking to your user. Mm -hmm. And when you use you and your, the, your user or your reader, when they're going through a manual, will sort of just unconsciously acknowledge that they're being the, the person being spoken to. And they don't need to because, you know, one of the times, some of the times when you're trying to use you and your and you're trying not to use the word you, you'll wind up writing a sentence that's unnecessarily complicated yeah. mm -hmm. for what you're trying to explain instead of saying, you know, pick up the um, the wrench and do something. And sometimes you can get away without using any of you. Right. But sometimes you just need to because you want to connect with the person on the right. other end of that manual. Right. Yeah, and so, well, a lot of the time imperative moves sort of take the you out of the sentence mm -hmm. um, rather than saying, like, you should turn the wrench clockwise, you just say turn the wrench clockwise. Yeah. But other times it's useful to be able to use those those pronouns because yeah, if you don't the sentence gets really complicated mm -hmm. or sometimes uh, unnaturally kind of stilted sounding, especially if you're using like one instead of one, your one word if one could. Right. Yeah. Nobody's gonna write that anymore. Right. Or a person <laughs> might do this thing if they yeah. were you know, just just say you. Yeah. It's usually easier. Yeah. But it's just not always needed depending on depending on the sentences and, and it's just like kind of straight imperative mood with you know, specified you might might do the trick by itself. Yeah, I think it does depend upon the context and but ultimately you wanna keep the user as close to the action as possible in a lot of these instruction manuals. And so I think you and your can be a really good way to do that because you are making that connection and, and keeping them close um, in a way that it would be pretty distance without. Yeah, that. even just like what you just said, you were saying you are right. trying to, you know, <laughs> and it would be unnecessarily distancing to say a technical writer when right. you're talking to actual people. Right. <laughs> okay, great. And we have a second question. Um, so this is someone who's interested in starting a technical writing career as a side career. Where might be some places to get practice or to find entry level assignments? That's a good question. Um, it's great. What's interesting about technical writing is that a lot of jobs that, that are for technical writers don't explicitly say technical writing in, in the job title. Um, so when I'm looking for jobs, I'm actually just looking for the word writing when I'm helping people look for jobs. I'm not necessarily looking for the explicit technical writing. And then the description of the task is 
often where you kind of think about like, oh, that's what they're asking, whether they're asking for someone to, to work within a company or an institution where um, the, the actual writing work will be technical, even though it may just say writer. Um, there's a number of uh, there's a social network for technical writers out there. Um, there's a number of organizations that sort of really work through LinkedIn to sort of identify connections for people that are doing freelance writing work. Um, and there's also a number of just uh, small technical writing organizations that do contract work. Um, I'm sure we can kind of post some more resources through the PACE mm -hmm. website um, that basically have a lot of the, the links to some of the organizations that do both uh, a lot of freelancing or where you can find opportunities. Um, the tricky thing is, and this is also sometimes true, that a lot of companies have people that don't are called technical writers, and 85% of the work they do is technical writing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is yeah. frustrating for somebody who's looking to sort of do freelance work sometimes, but um, it takes a lot of nuanced reading of some job ads sometimes. Right? Yeah. Right. And I think there's a lot of ways that you can sort of informally practice your technical writing skills yeah. online. Um, I think a lot of sites like eHow, mm -hmm. stuff like that, I think you can sort of register to become a, a contributor it's, for that. Yeah, Bolt is a good one. Yeah, and Festival does that. Um, and you could even like look on um, like more specific websites or maybe even like Reddit of Threads. Right. Yeah. Um, and and sort of see any place where people are, are trying to describe a process right. um, or where somebody has commented on a on a saying they're having trouble, you can practice by responding to their comment and saying, well, this is this is how you would do this process. Yeah, I was actually on uh, WikiHow this morning looking at some different examples, and you can go in there and set up an account, and just like Wikipedia, you can update some of the instructions and things like that. And so that might be a good way to kind of go out and get some practice. Yeah, you can practice and you can maybe even build up a portfolio right. um, mm -hmm. that way, which I think you, you're also going to if you if you take the PACE course, you would also right. have a little bit of a portfolio yeah, you will. Um, at the end of the course that you can use to show potential employers um, your tech writing skills. No, that's, a, that's a great point. That they will, you, when through this course, you will have specific materials to show that you have really some pretty complicated, complex skills mm -hmm. that you're going to be able to show off. And I was about to say, like, oh, you know, when I first got into technical writing, uh, the entry level stuff was a lot of uh, copy editing. Mm -hmm. Copywriting, um, that kind of a thing, uh, occasional sort of proofreading, and that was where I got my foot in the door. And then I got the opportunity to work on other projects, and then built a, a portfolio to sort of show that I could do other things. Uh, and then went back to some of those companies that I had done entry level things for, and showed them I, I can do a lot more. Right. And then sort of build contracts off of that. So the portfolio aspect of this course is really important. Yeah. Great. We just had another question come in. Um, do you all have any tips on how these skills can be transferred to instruction or how-to videos? Sure. I think um, so. A lot of the a lot of the tips that we've talked about today, and a lot of the concepts that we're going to talk about in the course, can pretty directly be transferred to videos because there is a lot of writing that goes on in that. You're going to have a script, and you're going to be trying to accomplish a lot of the same kinds of things that we're we're talking about in these written documents just um, in a video format. So I think that there are direct connections between you know, making sure that you're keeping the writing centered on the user, <clears throat> making sure that you are tailoring the message for that user, that you are detailing all of the elements that they will need, that you're um, detailing all the steps that they will need. All of that I think would be a pretty direct transfer yeah. even if you were recording a video um, going through the task rather than creating an instruction manual for example. Yeah, you still want to make sure you defined all the terms and, and like we were saying with like numbering the steps, you would probably in a video want to call attention to now we are starting a new step. So mm -hmm. whether that's verbally like next, we're going to do such and such, or you could um, sort of insert like a visual like number one or something into the video to help yeah. right. separate steps. Yeah. And and you know, and think of in the same way your instruction manual involves pictures or diagrams to sort of draw your user's attention or your reader's attention. The the video is going to have to do the same thing. Most frustrating ones because I'll Google everything and find a video on YouTube and how to do something. Mm -hmm. And the most frustrating ones don't break it down by specific steps, like mm -hmm. you're saying. And two is that the camera is 
position on a tripod across the room and I can't see what's going on. Right. Yeah. So think of that camera as the eye of the person that's actually needing to detect. They need to get in there close with you. They need to be able to see the specifics as you're describing them step by step. Um, there's a lot more uh, ways in which video can be a little bit more complicated and can do some things that just print manuals can't. Um, that sometimes takes um, takes extra time in editing. Yeah. You know, and there has to be more overlays and changes in audio quality and more than one cut uh, yeah. of, of, to get the, the shot exactly right. Definitely. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, and it usually has to take more time in the sort of post-production. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of time, um, I watch a lot of YouTube videos and a lot of how-tos, um, and I've heard some of the people that I watch talk about the time that goes into it and saying basically for if there's one minute of video footage, then it might take them, you know, over an hour, you know, several hours to produce that one minute of content. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of a lot of work goes into that. Um, so I think that there are some direct connections there. Well, I'll just add one more thing in too. Um, in how-to videos tend to be tend to be shorter, mm -hmm. or they're better when they're shorter. Because right. in an instruction manual, someone might have the manual out the entire time they're doing the process. They're not going to want to be watching a video the entire time they do a process. Right. Otherwise, you're making a movie. Right. Yeah. Right. That's, you're there for two hours watching the video. Yeah. Right. Great. So it's it's usually a much more condensed form of what. The manual, you can take as much time as you want with that. Video tend to be a lot more compressed. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so I think it's good to keep in mind the scope of the instructions that you're trying to convey in a video and know whether the, the process is more complicated than really yeah. lends yeah. itself to, to a video format. Or if it could just be broken up into multiple videos. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's something that we talk about. In, um, technical writing, and we'll talk about in this course whenever we're working on um, our first one of our first projects, which is an instruction manual, is making sure that you have the proper scope for what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that, as I'm teaching technical writing right now, I'm having a lot of those conversations where their instruction manuals should be between 10 to 15 steps, and people might come with something that's way too complicated, and you know you can't really talk about in 10 to 15 steps. I was going through an example of how to pack a duffel bag for. Um, and I was thinking, you know, oh, I can totally do this in 10 to 15 steps. And then I had to spend four steps talking about how to fold a shirt. And it's like, well, maybe not. Actually, this is more complicated than I thought. Um, or you have the opposite thing happen where, you know, it's like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an instruction manual on how to you know, make a cup of tea. And it's like you boil the water and pour it over the tea bag and you're done. So I think that finding that right kind of scope for the format um, can be a really important part of that process. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My favorite one that was I've ever seen is the instruction manual. Also, should have been about 10 to 15 steps. Mm -hmm. How to drive a stick shift. Uh, <laughs> That's a lot more than yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> it's really more complicated. Yeah. 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 And it's it's about knowing genre too, because like yeah. making a, a quality cup of tea might only be a few steps, but there's there could be a lot of other information that goes into it, like how hot the water should be for a specific type of tea. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily belong in the instruction manual genre. Right. It might be like a table, an extra table that that gives, you know, the, the proper temperatures for different kinds of tea and the proper steeping times. So it's not necessarily an instruction manual, even if it is uh, information that needs to be conveyed. Right. Yeah, it could be much more complicated than that. I didn't use coffee because I I have no people who can write a 15 <laughs> yeah, yeah. instruction manual on coffee. And but it's probably yeah, and, and tea, like, he doesn't like the actual process doesn't necessarily need to be that many steps. Right. Um, even if it is, even if there's a lot of information, it might it might be that like a you know you have like a three step instruction manual accompanied by a page of tips and tricks and right. things that yeah, you yeah. should know about tea. Right. It's all Probably about genre. Strong opinions on tea. I, yeah. I guess I do. <laughs> Actually, there's a specific graduate student in our department who I um, I think graduated last year, but I remember having lots of conversations with her about. About our facilities not producing quality <laughs> tea. <laughs> That's great. Any more more episodes? I know that's it for us right now. All right. Well, keep your questions coming. This is cause this is a great you know discussion. We want to make sure all your questions are answered. So I can I can go as quickly or as slowly in this next portion. So I want to tell you a little bit about the technical writing courses. We have one course that's up and coming here in March. Uh, runs March 6th through April 2nd. It's a four-week course, 100% online. 
We call it asynchronous, which means that you are working on materials at your time, at your pace, but you're paced by Rich Collins here. So he's going to be giving you prompts, he's going to be giving you materials to work through, pacing you each week um, and keeping you on target to you know, completions of assignments, discussion board forums. Um, he's really facilitating mentoring and, and helping to edit, critique, and you know, give you feedback week to week, um, you know, day by day as you kind of work through your assignments each week. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how you have the online course structured at this point? Sure, yeah. I think for me it's been really helpful because I also teach technical writing on eCampus at OSU. Um, I really see this course as a shrunk down version of that where we're kind of working with some of the same material, working on some, some of the same projects. And so there will be uh, materials that are available to you, there will be videos online that you can kind of watch that will walk you through some different processes, and then also uh, we have what we call comprehension checks for each of those where you're um, kind of testing out that knowledge and, and getting some feedback from me on how much um, how well we're working with each of those elements. And so we're going to have some piece of writing that's due every week. Um, our first project, like I said, will be an instruction manual, and our last project will be a technical description. Um, but there's going to be some form of writing happening each week, some form of technical writing, um, and so and then giving all of the materials that are necessary to complete that. Mm -hmm. so. Typically our courses range between three to eight hours of work a, a week. Mm -hmm. Would you say that falls? Yes. For, for the student? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think that that's, that's definitely accurate. Um, and a lot of it does depend upon how comfortable you are with writing in general um, and, you know, and that kind of thing as far mm -hmm. as how much work you're going to have to put into each of the documents. Um, but I think three to eight hours is, that sounds right on target to okay. me. Great. Well, we also are pulling um, from some industries. We've had a lot of company interest in this in this course. And so we're hosting a two-day on-site boot camp in Portland. They're going to be spread out by a week, but it's February 18th to February 20th, and, and sorry, be very technical <laughs> how I say that, and February 25th. So it's 16 hours, eight hours the first day, and eight hours the second day with some work time in between to really implement what you've been learning day one to day two, mm -hmm. lots of dialogue and conversation. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you structured that differently? Yeah, so I think the thing that's really cool about the in workshops is that it's an opportunity to have a really intensive experience or two really intensive experiences um, and you it's going to be much more um, group oriented so we'll be able to actually work in groups and work together um, and so I think there'll be much more of a communal aspect to these workshops the online section is really good if you're if you do need to work at your own pace and you're kind of managing this around um, some different, you know, your job and things like that, and you want to kind of work on it in the evenings or on the weekend um, for a couple of hours, then I think that that can be a really good way to go because you are able to kind of pace it yourself, whereas this is going to be much more intensive. You kind of come in for eight hours and we're going to go through a ton of material in that time. We'll have a week to reflect on it and then come back and do it again the next week. Um, and so I think that each of those have their own benefits. Um, it just kind of depends upon how you learn best and what kind of experience you're looking for. Great. And this course um, is, like both of them, are open to the public. Um, uh, so you you know pay as you go. So uh, just wanted to kind of throw that out there. We also again have the opportunity to customize the training. We have a syllabus listed up on our website. Um, and Rich would work with the company to customize it for a group of individuals to bring this course in company. And that's, we, we just start that with an, a free open needs assessment, you know, really understanding the company's needs and then transitioning it to your time frame and format for the company. So we're identifying as the, the target audience of this is anyone who writes kind of explanations of data and what, what we've, you know, talked through manuals today, business writers, engineers, and scientists. Rich was sharing with me a lot of um, students in the College of Engineering are taking this as part of their degree program as they enter into the workforce, um, professional writers and entrepreneurs and folks that work in the IT industry as well. So am I adding into other target audiences that you've seen of interest? One of the, I think this is probably included in that target audiences, but we were chatting beforehand about look at all the places in which technical writing happens. Mm -hmm. And we were saying, well, so much technical writing happens both within the workplace, um, but then also we rely on it for so many other things. Mm -hmm. Technical writing that happens. I know when I have a problem with something, I'll Google it and I'll find the right message board. 
And there's lots of technical writing that happens there, too. It's yeah. something that just helps so many people get so much done mm -hmm. in the world. And it's one of the one of the sneaky things about technical writing is when it's done really, really well, you almost don't even notice that it's there. Right. right? It sort of almost slips in unnoticed because what you wanted to do was do the thing you came to get to do in the first place. The technical writing helped you get there, and then it sort of disappeared. And you don't, you might not need it again. That's that exact same task. So it can be incredibly powerful that way, um, and it gets a lot of stuff done in the world. Yeah. So let's learn a little bit about the program objectives. Do you want to step through those, Rich? Sure. So our program objectives are apply and adapt flexible writing process strategies to produce clear, high-quality deliverables in a multitude of technical writing genres, use professional technical writing conventions of clean and clear design, style, and layout of written materials, gather and apply researched information that is appropriate to your field as demonstrated by reading and analyzing documents and citing sources correctly, and write clearly, correctly, and concisely, um, which is probably my favorite one of the outcomes just because it is hopefully clear, correct, and concise. Um, <laughs> and so those, all of those outcomes are really, those are the core principles that all of the activities we're going to be doing in the course are organized around. Um, and so if you're kind of wanting to know and review what the course is about, then I think that that's a really good place to go because we keep those at the forefront of our mind whenever we're working on the different activities and the different lectures and all of those different elements. Um, that's kind of how we're organizing it. And the other thing I would pull out from there is the part where um, it is appropriate to your field. So there is some opportunity there in the assignments to kind of customize the documents that you're working on to whatever industry you're working in um, or what industry you're interested in. So I think that that's a, another important piece of that. Absolutely. And that kind of ways into the next slide here where we're talking about really what you're going to learn some theoretical concepts but really apply everything that you're learning very practically in this course with real life you know examples you can bring in that you need to work on um, and actually bring them into the classroom you're you're mentored by rich throughout the the two days or the four weeks online um, so if you want to add anything here about your learning approach in both formats sure so I think that this graph here actually does a really good job of kind of showing that um, the learning approach. We kind of start off mostly taking in a lot of information, getting a general idea of what technical writing looks like, um, and kind of coming to terms with that, and then we ramp up and start producing a lot of writing that really happens right before the end of the course is going to be um, our largest project, and then it kind of tapers down with a smaller writing project at the end. Um, and so I find that approach really useful. It's one that I use in most of the classes that I teach where you kind of start out gaining a lot of information, apply that information, and then have a chance to kind of reflect on it and um, to apply it in a more concise format. Um, and so I think that that's going to be the way that both of these classes go. So just wanted to kind of um, also add in here that we're seeing with most of our courses, they're all practical in nature. Um, this course is definitely included. You'll see an immediate return on, on your investment of you know, being able to apply what you're going to learn in this course next day on your job. Opportunity to extend your resume skills and diversify your skills, improve your skills if you're looking to you know, tool up to advance in your current career or change careers. Um, freelance is a new opportunity. And I think I loved your discussion today about how technology, and I'm free to thought the videos, but of course I YouTube everything as well, mm -hmm. but how you know, manual writing and, and technical writing plays into that experience and, and really having how those two worlds, technology and the art of writing, mix and are married together. So thank you. That was great. So how do you get started? Um, classes again start this February. You can register online. We have um, student services that can help step you through. You will have a, a record um, retained here at Oregon State University for your non-credit education. Um, so you'll have a transcript. You'll also receive a certificate or a digital and a digital badge to share in your LinkedIn or social profiles. Um, so again, not to mention that the portfolio of work that you'll be leaving with. Um, for your attendance today, we are going to send you this webinar with a coupon code. So thank you again for participating. Emily, is there any final questions that you've seen come through? Um, you know, I think that we have addressed them all. Let me see. I saw something just come in. Um, okay, so there is a question. So the on-site course 
was described as having group work involved. Is that something that applies to the technical writing field in general? Is it typically kind of a group project or um, are people typically working on their own? Maybe you can talk about that just a little. Sure, so I think it probably varies depending on where you're working, but I know from my experience in the different industries I've worked in, um, there's always going to be some kind of collaborative element to the job. And so I think that that's certainly going to be the case with some technical writing documents as well. Um, if you look at something like an instruction manual for a large corporation, I can guarantee you that there are going to be a lot of eyes on that document. And so it's going to be a piece of um, collaborative work. Um, whereas if it's a startup or something like that, it might kind of be one person managing all of that. So I think a lot of it depends upon where you're working and what the project looks like. Um, but I think there's definitely going to be um, instances of that in technical writing. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about most people that start or do work as technical writers or do technical writing work in a company or organization, usually you're not the first person to have done some of that work. Mm -hmm. So you're building on what was already there and you're building for the future and you're probably not the only one who has knowledge about all the things, all the processes that have to go into the material that makes that manual. So even if you're the one person working on an instruction manual, say, you still have to talk to all the subject matter experts right. that have built the materials, that have knowledge of the dangers, that, so that you can kind of build from them. So there's a lot of collaborative writing that goes into something that even might seem like an individual writing process. Right. And a lot of times, um, whenever you're coming in, it can be updating a manual or updating a document that yeah. someone else wrote. Um, that's something I think, you know, the nature of, of just at this point is that people kind of do a lot of different jobs in a short span of time. And so you can kind of come in, it might have been a document that was written by someone else last year, the year before, and you're kind of taking the reins now. And you'll have to either talk to that person or work with the material that they've created. So I think a lot of times it can be that kind of collaboration as well. Mm -hmm. Collaborative writing, I think, whether it's technical writing or any other kind of workplace writing, is just kind of a fact of most jobs these days. And it's helpful to, to kind of practice your skills there um, and, and like know what technologies uh, you have to sort of facilitate that collaborative writing, whether it's yeah. using like Google Documents or uh, the various review features in Microsoft Word um, and how to kind of navigate all those tools uh, effectively, I guess, and efficiently. Yeah, yeah. Emily, any other questions at this time? Nope, I think that covers us. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you all so much for, for attending. We want to still be able to um, engage with you. Please don't hesitate to reach out to our contact information. I'll go back to it just one more second. So you have our emails. You can contact um, Pace at Oregon State. You can also contact us directly. We will respond back with your questions. We're sharing this presentation in the next 24 hours. Feel free to respond back at that time or continue to share the presentation. Pass it on to someone who, who would need some tips on do's and don'ts. Um, and I want to thank Rich, Aaron, and, and Claire so much for being here today. It was wonderful to learn about the documentation skills, and I can't wait to implement some of your practices. So thank you so much. And thank you so much, Beaver Nation, for being here with us today. This was an excellent webinar and look forward to serving you.